What's going on everyone? It's Ben from YGO from Zero back with another retro Yu-Gi-Oh video and this is going to be a bit different from my normal stuff. Uh, if you're new to the channel, I basically go through old formats of the Yu-Gi-Oh trading card game and just sort of dive into a bunch of different decks and show off gameplay most of the time. But this will be more of a discussion video and it will be based on something that's been going on in the Yu-Gi-Oh community lately over the past week or two. Uh, so if you've missed all the sort of discussion about this, Basically, people have been talking about what actually constitutes a good deck in the game. And there's a lot of different opinions on this. Other Yugi tubers have made videos that express their opinions much better than I could on this sort of stuff. Um, but I've noticed that a lot of their sort of commentary is on the state of the game in modern and what a good modern sort of deck uh, looks like for the game as it is now. And that's well and good. Uh, I think that it is important to discuss because modern is the most popular format of the game. Um, but I do think that there are some differences between the modern incarnation of the game and talking about what a good deck is there and the retro format of the game and talking about what a good deck is there. So I figured I'd throw my hat into the ring and talk about why I think there is such a difference between what a good deck is in modern and what a good deck is in the old retro formats that I've been playing on the channel and that people play like Goat and Edison. So before I discuss what I think a good deck is in retro formats of the game, we got to discuss what a good deck is in modern formats of the game. And note that like good has many different meanings and this is part of why this discussion lasts as long as it has. Um, because for every different person, uh, they're going to have a different definition of good, right? Some people will think that good decks are the ones that can win tournaments, and others think that good decks are any deck that has a game plan. And you may think that that is a very low bar to clear, but as someone who's currently going through vampire format right now and having to look at the Guardian cards, <laughs> I know that there are some decks in this game that just do not have a win condition. So, uh, you know, classifying a good deck as one that has a win condition, I, I can potentially see. Now, uh, I think that because, you know, this discussion is based on, like, definitions that we have of the word good, uh, I'm just going to lay out my definition of the word good. I generally think that a good deck is one that can do well in a competitive setting. So one that can win a tournament. Um, I know that this doesn't encapsulate everything about a deck. For instance, there are decks that, you know, maybe aren't the best mechanically compared to some other decks in the forum. Maybe they don't do as much, but they are well stacked up for that metagame and so can win a tournament that way. Uh, so people might not classify those sorts of decks as actually being good or not. Um, but I think it's just easiest if we talk about, you know, what decks can actually, you know, win tournaments, because that is a pretty easy sort of metric to look at. Um, now, part of the issue with doing this in modern formats is that there's so little exploration, or not little exploration, but there's so little time to explore um, these formats that there is a lot that could potentially not get covered. And also, there aren't as many, like, events uh, in any given modern format before new product comes out and new cards and decks are introduced, which means that, you know, we'll never quite really know uh, what all the best decks are in a given format unless people go back later in the game's history and keep playing that format over time and really dive into what potentially the best decks are. So in a modern setting, you know, people prepare for specific events based on the current ideas of what is going to be at that event. And that's not unique to modern formats. Like people do that in older formats as well, which I'll get into. Um, but I think in modern formats, it is more important because people don't have necessarily like years to go through this. Uh, they got to prepare for the event coming up soon. And so they prioritize that sort of thing. And this does make it easier, I think, for more professional players to top these events with very specific decks that may not necessarily be on anyone else's radar um, because these players are very good at that sort of deck and thus can practice that deck, figure out the lines, and if other people are not expecting that deck, they really haven't had the time to prepare for that matchup because, you know, if you're preparing for, like, Cash Tira, right, you're not going to necessarily be prepared for, like, Manadium, right? Um, so I do think that that is a big factor in the different sort of results that have happened over the past uh, couple of months with some of these tournaments, right? Because there's been a wide array of decks that have topped, based on my understanding of this. I'm not the most in tune with the modern scene, as many other YouTubers are. Um, but from my understanding, you know, there's been a variety of decks topping. And I think that that is because of the state of modern. Um, 
And when this is compared to things like GOAT format, where yeah, Chaos Turbo is basically seen as like the best deck and like most tournaments just feature that deck topping, it's not necessarily because Chaos Turbo is like the tier zero GOAT format deck. It's just because it's a very good deck and, you know, a lot of experimenting has gone on to yield those sorts of decks and the top spots. Whereas you can't necessarily have that in a modern setting. And people are prepared for Chaos Turbo. People are prepared for GOAT Control. People are prepared for whatever other GOAT decks, you know, you're going to expect to see in a tournament. Whereas in the modern game, there are a lot of different archetypes out there. Uh, and, you know, while you could try preparing for every single archetype that could possibly pop up, you're realistically only going to prepare for, like, at most 10, right? Um, so... I do think that that does skew the results a bit and sort of mask what the actual, like, you know, factual good deck would be if you could even define a deck like that. Um, because, you know, a lot of it does come down to unexpectedness and knowledge. Um, so I do think that that is a unique factor of the modern game that a lot of retro formats don't necessarily have because with retro formats, they don't actually change. They're a snapshot in time and so people are going to be able to explore them a lot more in depth and really get a sense of what decks are best, like, on a mechanical level. So now that we've talked about modern, let's talk about the retro format scene. And when we're talking about old retro formats, there are a lot of retro formats you can pick from. I mean, I've covered a lot on my channel, but the two main retro formats right now are Goat and Edison. There are some other very popular ones like Hat and Tengu Plant as well. Um, but in terms of, like, huge tournaments happening, uh, Goat and Edison are the two top dogs. And it's not hard to see why. Both formats are very, very fun, very skillful, uh, and, you know, there's just a big community centered around them. And so that makes it easier for people to get into them. Uh, it makes it so that the tournaments are even bigger and more hype. And, uh, you know, it's just great to see these two formats thriving, uh, in my opinion, because I think that the more ways to play the game, the better. But because Goat and Edison have been somewhat thoroughly explored by this point, uh, the metagame has sort of solidified a little bit. Now, you do see variation in a bunch of the decks that happen. I mean, if you look at GOAT, people are talking every tournament about different deck techs that do pop up, that play well against certain matchups versus others. And in one of the recent GOAT format tournaments, uh, Earth Aggro actually took second place, I believe. Uh, so that's very, very exciting to see, as Earth Aggro isn't necessarily a deck that was on, like, the most people's radars as, like, a top, top deck of the format. But... If you are, like, you know, a professional GOAT player or playing at an extremely, extremely high level, uh, you won't necessarily have the sort of surprise factor that a lot of decks in the modern metagame can provide. Uh, partially because GOAT format has a much smaller card pool, but partially because, like, a lot of the jank decks in GOAT have sort of been labbed out before. Um, and so people have sort of dived deep into all the sort of nooks and crannies of the format, and seeing these decks and realize, like, oh, this deck just isn't really up to snuff. Uh, or if there is a deck that's, like, sort of rogue and can potentially do well, like, you know, Relinquished Chaos, um, people can sort of realize that in when it, you know, goes to a tournament and then prepare for that for the next GOAT tournament. So, you know, long term, these decks that do sort of succeed based on surprise factor, uh, those decks get adapted to because people learn from that and they prepare for that. So the decks that will survive at the top of the pile are the decks that, you know, just have this mechanical edge, right? Like they can do more things, more unfair things uh, in more versatile ways. And I think we really have seen that with GOAT, whereas a lot of people are, like, saying, you know, like, Chaos Turbo is the king of GOAT. It's the best deck in GOAT format. And, uh, you know, while there are other decks that can compete, Chaos Turbo is the one putting up the most results. Now, I'm not a GOAT expert. I am planning on, you know, covering that when I reach that on my channel. And also, I have played some games, so I'm familiar with different parts of it. Um, so if there are any GOAT format, like, enthusiasts who know better than me, then, you know, Comment down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But uh, I do feel like when the metagame is sort of calcified like that into that rigid structure, uh, the definition of a good deck definitely changes, right? Um, because instead of a deck being good that can potentially top an event, uh, you don't really have that as much, right? Like, you can't have, like, pet good decks that just suddenly top an event one time and, you know, then are seen as being potentially good because then they potentially get hated out. Um, so I think a good deck on, if you're not just 
classifying it by like competitive standards could be a deck like, you know, it's a bit jank, but it has a potential good matchup against things like, you know, Chaos Turbo or Goat Control or Warriors or something like that. Um, that would be how some people would potentially classify that if they're not going based off of tournament success. But uh, I think a lot of these sort of good decks in GOAT uh, are mainly the ones that sort of succeed at tournaments and do very well um, because the tournaments have sort of solidified what the best decks mechanically are in that format. Now for Edison, things are a bit different, although the format has also sort of uh, solidified around certain decks. Um, in Edison format, you know, certain decks have, you know, gone to pretty much every tournament um, that's been held recently and done pretty well, like things like Vayu Turbo, uh, Diva Hero, like things like that, or variations of those sorts of decks are widely seen as being very good um, because they are very good. You know, they've won tournaments, uh, they're very, very good mechanically, um, and they just, you know, take names. The difference I think that I see between Edison format and GOAT format is that it feels like with Edison format, people People still feel like there are decks that are undiscovered and like very good decks that are undiscovered. Um, whereas GOAT has had like almost a decade or maybe more than a decade, I don't actually know exactly when it started, um, to sort of, you know, experiment with and explore. Uh, Edison format is still relatively recent in terms of like historical real valuation. Uh, and so, you know, new decks are being discovered, like the Gemini deck, which was discovered a little bit ago, uh, that saw a lot of hype. And to be fair, the deck is hype. It may not be like a tier one deck um, because it hadn't really done as well at certain tournaments, um, but it is still very exciting. And seeing a deck like that that was on no one's radar come out of the woodworks and, and be really cool uh, does inspire people to sort of come up with new deck ideas and new strategies that might also similarly have that sort of rise. So I do feel like for Edison, there is a lot more sort of uh, hope for these sorts of jank strategies or just off meta strategies coming in and mixing up the meta game. However, I think that as time goes on, Edison will reach a point where GOAT is at now, where after a certain period of time, um, people will realize like, yeah, we sort of like exhausted all the potential options for this format. Um, and that will probably take a bit as the card pool for Edison is a bit deeper than it is for GOAT. Um, but I do feel like, you know, after people have really like looked over every part of the format in, with scrutiny, uh, you will sort of resolve into that state like GOAT. And I think that's the fate for most retro formats. And to be clear, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I actually think it's a very cool thing. Like you can get a lot of joy out of, you know, sort of seeing what decks are at the top and tweaking those decks a bit to have different meta matchups based on what you think is going to be in a tournament. And it's a bit similar to what happens in modern tournaments, but it's also quite different because you have a better idea of the matchup spread uh, and you have a better idea of what decks, you know, you can do well against and bad against and prepare against. Um, so I do think that it leads to a different sort of style of preparation, a different style of metagaming. Uh, and I think that's very, very cool. So I do think that, you know, there's nothing wrong with the format reaching that point, but I do think it does change the definition of what a good deck is, or at least what people perceive good decks to be. Now, of course, I've been talking about the most popular retro formats, but I do think there's another level below that. So, you know, we've talked about the modern state of the game, we've talked about the most popular retro formats, but there are a lot of other retro formats that don't necessarily see as much play. And I'm not just talking about the communities that, you know, have a fair amount of play around them, um, but don't necessarily host as big of tournaments as Goat and Edison, things like, you know, Tengu Plan or Hat or something. Uh, I'm just talking about like, you know, sort of the formats that I covered on my channel as well. Uh, things like Yada, which, you know, not many people play, um, or even the people that do play them. When we do have tournaments, I think the biggest Yada tournament we actually held on the YGO from Zero Discord, which was really fun. We hold monthly tournaments there uh, every month. So, you know, if you're interested in playing, definitely head on over there. Links in the description. Um, but that was only around like 36 people, I think. I think that was the number. It was definitely like not too much higher than 32. Uh, and that was like the biggest one I think we've had on record since the format was actually, you know, the modern format. Um, and I think that because, you know, we haven't been able to get these super big turnouts for like all these tournaments, uh, it does shift how the metagame is viewed. I mean, for Yada specifically, uh, some of the past couple of tournaments were run by like really out there decks like Gravekeepers and Gear Freed uh, Control with Blast with Chain and stuff. And you know, when those sorts of decks win, it raises the question, like, are these decks good because of just their mechanical things? Like, are they better than the rest because of 
uh, you know, the ability of Gear Free to combo with Blast with Chain for a pop, or Great Creeper Spy, you know, bringing out, like, Spear Soldier or something? Uh, or are they just, you know, piloted by a very good player? Because both of those decks were actually piloted by the same duelist. Uh, so is that duelist just really good at Yada, and that's why uh, they managed to win? And are the decks actually, like, Tier 2 or something? Uh, or are the decks just, like, actually legit and can see future tournament success, like, on a broad level? It's hard to tell when the tournaments are so small. Uh, and I'm not necessarily saying this as, like, a complaint. Uh, I think that it can be fun to have these, like, more smaller, intimate tournaments. But I do think that, you know, when evaluating the metagame as a whole, it does make it a little bit difficult to uh, sort of figure out what the best deck is in a lot of cases. Um, and so when it comes to good decks, we're kind of in a situation like the modern situation where, you know, did Gearfried uh, Control win a Yada tournament because it's like very good or because it was something that people weren't really expecting? Uh, and can it win tournaments in the future now that people are prepared for it? These are questions that I don't quite know. And I think we'll need even more tournament testing in the future to actually figure out. And some of these formats just won't necessarily get that testing in the future because they're so niche, right? Like, I think that I've covered some really great formats on the channel that I think could become popular in the future potentially. Um, but right now, we're just not really at that point. Um, and I'm not sure if we'll ever reach that point in the future. So, you know, it does make it a bit tricky to evaluate decks like that. And, you know, a lot of the time, I think these very, very niche retro formats are often more like modern format in that way uh, than like, you know, Edison and Goat because it just doesn't have that same level of deep, deep knowledge uh, that those other formats do have. I also think that like when discussing this, like the layout of people playing these smaller formats does actually contribute as well. Uh, a lot of people playing these more niche formats are a bit more casual and I don't think that's a bad thing. Like I've showed off many casual decks on this channel and uh, I encourage casual play. I think no matter how you enjoy the game, no matter how competitively you take it, uh, as long as you're having fun, I think that's what matters in this game. And I think that that can skew the discussion about what a good deck is as well, though. If there are more casual players, you know, the bar for a good deck is potentially going to be different than if we're talking about, like, top pro players. Uh, if there was, like, pro events for these sorts of formats, uh, I feel like the discussion is a bit different there. And I think that you can see this most clearly in Yugi Kaiba format, which is one of the earliest formats in the game's history. Uh, very, very bare bones. So honestly, most of the decks that are potentially viable have been sort of labbed out and explored. And so people have a general idea of the different types of decks that they can expect. However, I would say that the results of tournaments is actually somewhat skewed. And that may seem a bit weird as I was talking about how in GOAT format, you know, the metagame is sort of like solidified around the top decks because people know pretty much all the decks that are out there and have explored them and labbed them out thoroughly. But I do think in Yugi Kaiba, it is true because of the player base, right? Like one of the best decks in Yugi Kaiba is Stall Mill. It's a very, very unfun deck for a lot of people um, because it's just basically playing a 43 card deck, um, playing a bunch of defenders, and leveraging the fact that Yugi Kaiba doesn't really have as much removal as other formats do, and just waiting for your opponent to deck out. Like, you are playing card destruction most of the time, but there's no real, like, empty jar combos to, like, quickly mill your opponent out. No, you're just waiting. You're waiting for them to draw through their deck. Um, and for a lot of people, that's unfun, so they don't play it. So... If you are a competitive player going into a Yugi Kaiba tournament, uh, you might be inclined to, you know, sort of play hate against the Stall Mill matchup in your main deck if you're not playing Stall Mill already. However, very few people actually play Stall Mill um, because a lot of people playing in the tournament are not necessarily doing it because they, like, really, really want to win, right? Uh, I mean, everyone who plays generally wants to win, but, like, different people take it at different levels, right? So... In more competitive formats, you probably have a fair amount of people playing Stall Mill. Like, you know, if you had a tournament of, like, 32 people playing in Yugi Kaiba, then I'd expect maybe, like, half the field on Stall Mill because it's just very, very good. Uh, and if half the field was on Stall Mill, you could potentially main deck hate for it because there is hate out there for it. Uh, there are things like burn cards. Uh, there are things like Trap Master if you want to snipe an ultimate offering. Uh, there are various different counterplays to Stall Mill that you could play if you wanted to. However, if you're deciding what to put into your deck in preparation for a tournament and you play more hate towards Stall Mill, 
uh, that hit can actually cost you in matchups against decks that are a bit more quicker paced, more aggressive decks, um, but decks that are also a bit more jank. Um, and, you know, you got to kind of weigh the pros and cons of that. If you only expect like one or two people to be on stall mill, but everyone else to be on a deck that's a bit more aggressive and faster paced, uh, then are you going to put the things in your deck that deal with stall mill, but lose you the game against those decks? Uh, or are you going to put the things in your deck that, you know, are just generally good against a general deck, you know, like those more aggressive paced decks as well, um, but might put you at a disadvantage to stall mill? It's an interesting question, and it does warp the metagame around it, and warp the question of, like, what the best deck in the format is, because I feel like the meta could evolve further to adapt to Stall Mill, but uh, it's not quite doing that. And this isn't to say that I think it has to do that. I'm not trying to force people to go out there and play Stall Mill. It's just the reality of the situation. So with niche formats like that, decks that could potentially be good in the metagame as meta picks against very powerful decks are not necessarily as good. Uh, and it can warp the discussion about what's good uh, in that way as well. And, you know, ultimately, this long rambling discussion comes down to uh, the definition of good varies based on what type of Yu-Gi-Oh you're playing uh, and, you know, what format you're playing as well. Um, if you're playing competitively, obviously your definition is going to be very different from someone playing casually with friends. Uh, and if you're playing modern format, your definition is going to be very different from someone playing Edison, going to be very different from someone playing Yada, for instance. So these were just some thoughts that were like rattling around my mind in all this discussion. Uh, and I hope this sort of brought forward the sort of retro perspective on this discussion, because I do think it is a good uh, discussion to have in all different corners of the Yu-Gi-Oh! community. Um, so I hope that you all enjoyed this discussion. Uh, if you did enjoy it, uh, definitely subscribe to the channel for more content like this. Uh, I do a lot of gameplay videos as well, but I do like these discussions, and if y'all like them, then I'll happily do more. Um, also, let me know your thoughts on this down below, um, because I mainly made this video to start a discussion about what you all think about, like, whether the definition of good does change from format to format or not. I personally think it does. Um, but you could definitely sort of have a different view than me, and I'd be happy to discuss it down in the comments below. Um, but anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this, uh, as always, and until next time, I've been Ben from YJO from Zero, and I'm signing off.